Hey everybody, I guess this is probably um, lecture 10 and so today we're going to talk about sanctification. We're going to talk about the reality that God has made us saints. It's not a special induction into a, a group of uh, special people <laughs> uh, based upon some special works. It's what it means to be born again. It's the result of being born again. And um, we're also going to uh, talk about um, uh, one of the things that uh, is problematic uh, throughout uh, the Christian community, and that is um, confusing sanctification or uh, with Christian uh, maturity. So I was going to say Christian maturation, um, but uh, and that really comes down to the whole issue of folks wanting to you know, maintain this idea that we're in the process of sanctification. Uh, and right off the bat, I want to say this one thing. If we're in the process of sanctification, then when is it complete? And, you know, you ask that question to uh, some of the folks who are the strongest at espousing this philosophy because it's not scriptural. I understand. We're going to go over a few of the verses of scripture that people use to um, justify the idea or the notion of, of a process of sanctification. And I don't want to be uh, rude with this because I can understand why people will, would think that uh, sanctification is a process. But we want to. You, you are set now. We've gone through the Old Testament. You are set in in a in a, in a place in a position now to, to really. Uh, appreciate uh, more perfectly um, the sanctification uh, and, and what it means. And so, you know, Leonard Ravenhill said something that is absolutely profound, and that is that there is no sanctification beyond the sepulcher, or even sanctification within the sepulcher. And as I was going to say previously, many of the people who talk about a process of sanctification they will say, well, we will ultimately be sanctified once we die and then receive an immortal body. That is purely philosophical. That is purely an ideology, which is based upon um, tradition and has nothing to do with the biblical revelation. So, Listen up, because I think the most important thing for Bible students to get out of Bible college is fundamental understanding of what salvation is all about and what the core reality of faith is. What is faith? What is the faith that Paul was talking about? What is the faith that Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 8? These are absolutely essential and profound uh, you know, things to grasp and this subject is the most essential of all to grasp. And the faith is the reality of being born again, being made a new creation, of being begotten of God, becoming a, a new creature, possessing the divine nature, being born of the Holy Spirit, being washed with the water of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which is all this, we're just saying the same thing. It's about the life of God coming into us, about receiving a new heart, not a heart that is being changed by process, receiving a new spirit, not a spirit that is being changed by process, but a miraculous event that takes place by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is by grace that we're saved. This is a divine empowerment. This isn't God calling us something that we're not. Uh, the idea, once again, of positional salvation does not hold water. The reality of it is this is absolutely an event. This is an event, a miracle event of being changed, of being born again, of, of, of God coming to live on the inside of us, of Christ Jesus coming to dwell on the inside of us. The reality of it is, is when we're talking about being sanctified, it's like saying we're being saved. No, we're not. And there are many people that want to say we're being saved. And so now, let me just put it to you this way. If somebody said to you um, and you asked them, are you born again? And they said to you, you know, I'm being born again. 
Would you buy that? Wouldn't that sound odd to you? Well, it's the same thing. To say I'm being saved, it means I'm, it's the same as saying I'm being born again. It's really the same as saying I'm being sanctified. But yet, because the semantics is a little different and we don't really have the proper relationship to these words and to these concepts, well, then we just go ahead and accept it. It sounds okay and probably sounds okay because we've heard it said so many times. So you hear something that is, is wrong said over and over and over again, and perhaps then it becomes, it becomes okay. It becomes acceptable. So let me try to get into this thing with, with just laying out the basis. You know, number one, holiness is not um, positional. It is an encounter. It is interactive. That holiness that was given to Moses and that holiness that was given to Aaron and that holiness that was given to the tabernacle and to the vessels and to uh, Aaron's sons and to the people of Israel and, it, and to everyone who encountered this wonderful grace of God, that wasn't positional. That was something that was clearly shown to be given to be imparted, and then the result of that was the privilege and the access that they then had to interact with God. So it was in holiness given so that they can interact with God. And we've shown that over and again. So let's just start off like this. And, and let me just try to do this as systematically as I possibly can. I'm not really good at that. I am a guy that basically just flows by inspiration the best and when somebody puts a pencil and a piece of paper in my hand and tells me to follow an outline oh that is probably like prison to me um you know we all have different ways that we flow so just please you probably learn to basically keep up with me now and fortunately fortunately you have the notes inside of the book i am going to give you a test i am going to send a test to you and you know, I am really going to expect that you're going to do very well on this because this information is absolutely essential. I promise you that the test will not be abstract, that the test will deal with the most important things, uh, highlighted things that are essential for you to understand these this, this most important revelation of God of what he's done for us. I don't want to just call it a doctrine. I want to say the revelation of what God has done for us so that we can walk in it. Um, and so, sanctification. Uh, let's just start with the verse of scripture, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Paul's writing to the church. And he says into the church, which is at Corinth, Corinth he says to them, to them that are holy in Christ Jesus. And he didn't say to them that are being holy in Christ Jesus. He's writing to the whole church and nothing but the church. And you can think about all the problems that are going on within the church. And um, But that is an entirely different issue. We're talking about the new birth. We're talking about the miracle of salvation. We're talking about the empowerment of God to do what's right. And yes, people get empowered by God to do what's right. And they do that which is wrong. Praise God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and washes us. Washes us. That doesn't do away with the reality that God gave to us the ability to do what's right. That he gave us a new heart. That he gave us a new spirit. That he gave us his Holy Spirit. That he's empowered us with all that we need in order to live and grow and mature in the ways that belong to his life and his nature and his holiness and his, and his goodness. And, 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 you know, highlighting his love. And so um, it, there is no power greater than the power of God. And when the power of God is living on the inside of us, come on, what, what excuses do we have? You know how many verses of scripture in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that refers to the power of God that is on the inside of us, that we have this treasure in this earthen vessel, and which is the, uh, that the excellency of the glory and the power may be of God and not of us, that we know that all of these things that God has promised us, He's even into even into his fullness, which I'll talk a little bit more about that verse of scripture in Ephesians chapter three a little bit later. But that even coming into all the fullness of God is something that is supplied to us because according to him who works exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think, all that we could think or ask, according to his power that works within us. This the, the indwelling fountainhead of the very life of God, the wellspring of God 
that is in us at the new birth, springing up with the very life of God, even the spirit of the Lord flowing out of us like rivers. I mean, the, the excessive language that God uses to capture our attention about the reality that we truly belong to him. I mean, you can't have greater verbiage. And, and sanctification, first and foremost, you've already learned this. It is anything that is taken and brought into the sphere of that which belongs to God. By definition, it's sanctified or it's made holy. And I don't need to go through the Greek words and the Hebrew words, but, you know, it, um, uh, see, it's agiasmos, which is uh, sanctify, which we use to uh, translate uh, into the word sanctification, uh, which also means holiness, or agiazo, which is to be made holy, which is also the word for sanctified. And we see we, Paul is writing to the church to, uh, he's writing to them that are made holy in Christ Jesus, called to be holy ones or called to be saints, which are in every place, uh, in, which with all that are in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 1 Corinthians 1 2. When you look at the reality of sanctification in the New Testament, it isn't far removed from uh, uh, the, the reality of sanctification in the Old Testament. It's just in a, in a much higher and more complete and fulfilled way. The definition, however, has already been given to us. If that foundation has already been laid, the Lord isn't going to in any way suddenly take a word that has been used over and over again in the Old Testament, of which he has defined the meaning in so many interactive and practical ways, and then, you know, throw a curveball at us, so to speak, and completely redefine sanctification. What happens is God has given us this unspeakable gift, this amazing, glorious, wonderful gift of the new birth with the divine nature, with the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, with the indwelling of Christ Jesus. And it's just too much for people to believe. It's just too miraculous. And then if people, and then if folks then somehow um, don't have a consecration and commitment to God, not willing to obey God and follow on to know the Lord, then they're going to try to make excuses for themselves. Well, we don't want to be those folks. We just want to understand what is the revelation of God about sanctification? Is there any more important subject in the Bible than sanctification? No, because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That's all talking about sanctification. Once again, if it's a process, then when does it happen? And, you know, somehow uh, people want to have this idea or belief that it happens after that you die. But there's no verse of scripture in any way that indicates that. It happens at the moment of the encounter with God. Can we be possibly think of ourselves any more sanctified than to be made a vessel, a dwelling place for God Almighty to dwell? I mean, go take it back and superimpose it upon the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Is God going to move in while they're trying to get the tabernacle right? Is God going to move in while Nadab and Abihu, you know, basically fumble around and make all kinds of a mess of how it is to approach unto the Lord? You know, is just anybody going to be able to step up and do whatever they want to do and God is going to just accept it as it's okay because after all, he positionally sanctified them. He positionally made them holy and therefore does it really matter what they do? Well, then ask um, Nadab and Abihu about that. Ask Dathan and, and Korah and all his band about that. You know, ask Achan about that and so many others and so many other situations. The reality is that is absolutely the idea or the notion that people want to espouse with their concept of positional salvation or positional sanctification or positional righteousness. It is absolutely debunked by everything that God has revealed about himself and his expectation of his people in, in the Old Testament. You have to rewrite the Bible. And, and you know, it's amazing to me how many people are really willing to sit back and, and let that happen. You know, we're all sanctified by one act of grace. Jesus set himself apart, sanctified himself that we might be sanctified in him. He is forever perfected, them that are sanctified. In other words, we are complete in him. He is, how are we complete? We're complete because we're made a new creation, because we're born again, because God has worked the miracle of salvation. He's made us a fit dwelling place where we can house God. And, and, and that 
<laughs> we can house God. We can interact with God. We have access into the throne room by the Spirit. My goodness, we are, have oneness with the Holy Ghost. He that is joined to the Lord is one Spirit. Where Christ Jesus has come into us and dwells and dwells in us. I mean, think about it. Think about the reality of, of, of uh, the Scripture warning us that we can prove those who are false by simply recognizing if they somehow say that Christ has not uh, come in the flesh or, or they don't have Christ in them, you can recognize right there that that's, it's a false spirit. I mean, we know that he dwells in us, that Christ is in us, and that he is our confidence of glory. Um and, and that, that foundation is laid out by the Lord Jesus Christ in a radical way, as I was talking about last time in John chapter 14 and in John chapter 15 and 16 and 17, and which was the long, longest monologue that is recorded of the Lord Jesus um, in the New Testament, in the four Gospels. And to somehow say then that Christ Jesus dwells in us, but we're still being saved. Well, Christ Jesus is then somehow... Um, in a process of coming to dwell in us. And we are in the process of acquiring faith. And we are in the process of being born again. And we are in the process of being made a new creation. Look, you have either been born again or not. You are either born of the Spirit, born of the Word, born of God, born of the resurrection. You are either the sons and the daughters of Almighty God, or you're not. You can't have it both ways. To say, I am a son of God is the same as saying, I am born again. It's the same as saying, I've been made holy. It's the same as saying, I've been sanctified. It's the same as saying, I've been made a new creation. I've received the divine nature. I'm now fit and able to now be led by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, um, and, and to live by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness. So, I think one of the great exercises that you can do is to really convince yourself that these words that I'm using really are synonymous words, that you can't have Christ Jesus, you can't have God the Holy Ghost dwelling in you, nor be called the temple of the Holy Ghost if somehow you're not brought into the sphere of that which belongs to God. Of course we've been brought in the sphere of that which belongs to God. We've been bought with a price. We are not our own. I mean, how? How many, how many verses of scripture it, it does it take to tell somebody over and over and over again? And yet they won't get it. They will not listen they're, because they're convinced of something that is completely erroneous and, and their ears are, are closed up to simply hear what God with great reputation uh, repetition says over and over again. So, I mean, you look at John chapter uh, 1 and, and verse 14, and here we are, the Lord says, or verse 12, he said, as many as received him, to them he gave the authority to be the sons of God, uh, and to many as believed upon his name. And then we come, go all the way to 1 John chapter 3, and we hear, beloved, now are you the sons of God? And even, it, and though, and, and, um, and we're not of this world. And, and, and even though we don't appear or, uh, or we, we're not um, in that um, glorified state, uh, we know that we will see him as he is, for we shall be like him. Uh, that is a powerful, radical uh, verse of scripture. Then the verse four says that, and, and I didn't quote all of that absolutely the way King James quoted it. I'm, I'm trying to you know, be a little bit free and uh, uh, flowing with the translation to make sure that you're hearing what I'm saying. Um, and I could go back and quote it again, beloved, now are you the sons of God? And, and um, well, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, which I don't usually do. But nonetheless, I just move on to verse four. And, and verse four simply says, uh, everyone who has this confidence or this hope purifies, them, purifies himself even as he is pure. Let me just go to that verse of scripture real quick because there's something there that I want to grab a hold of. I'm, you know, I don't get paused on a verse of scripture unless there's a reason. So I'm just going to go. 
1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And that's really a powerful declaration of sanctification. Because how many times did the Lord Jesus say, between John chapter 14 and John chapter 17, that we are not of this world, even as he's not of this world. You talk about an underscoring of the reality that we have been brought out of the sphere of the profane, the common, the ordinary, and brought into the sphere of that which belongs to God. Nothing could, add, could you know, could uh, highlight that or, you know, put an exclamation uh, a mark by that uh, with any greater intensity than to say we're not of this world. Uh, I'm not of this world, even as he's not of this world. Radical declaration, radical statement. As Paul said, we've been translated from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of dear son. That is an absolute process, not process, but action in which we were transferred into the sphere of that which belongs to God. Sanctification is to be made holy. It is an act of encounter with God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's this miracle that then takes place that results in you and I being in him, being even as he is in this world, to walk just as he walks right now. All of those verses of Scripture, of course, then are found right here in 1 John 3. Uh, I mean, 1 John, the first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, we are to walk even as he walks. And... Um, but let me go on and, and not get too distracted here. Uh, and so he said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when we will see him, we shall be as he is. Now, radical declaration of a, a event that is yet to take place, but not an indication of a process of sanctification. Rather, simply a day in which we await for this corruptible body to put on incorruption and to put it on in such a magnitude that it's going to uh, it's going to be like his glorious body and so here's one of the verses of scripture that people will argue for a process of sanctification even on top and over well over top of the many more verses of scripture besides the ones I've already quoted and they will say, well, look at verse 3, every man that has this hope or confidence purifies himself even as he is pure. Fine, that's true, but it has nothing to do with the process of sanctification. We get to remain pure. In other words, I am going to keep myself pure. I have been made pure. I have been made holy. I have been made righteous. I've been made a new creation. I've been empowered with the ability to be strong in the strength of the Lord and power of his might. And that's a lot of ability, Ephesians 6.10 to say no to sin, to walk in something better than, uh, you know, uh, human uh, uh, human um, uh, self-control. I have divine self-control uh, by the Holy Ghost. I've been equipped. I've been empowered to just obey God and to say no to sin. Am I going to be tempted by sin? Absolutely. Is temptation, being tempted by sin, an evidence that there is still something seriously wrong with us? No, it is not. Okay. Understand, number one, Adam was tempted in an innocent, pure, holy nature. There was nothing unholy. There was nothing impure about Adam's nature at all when he was tempted. Furthermore, let's look at Jesus. Jesus, there was nothing unholy. There was nothing impure about his nature at all. He was God manifested in the flesh he was absolutely sinless in nature, sinless in conduct in every way, and yet he was tempted. The notion or idea that says or equates that temptation is equal to sin is completely debunked by the reality that Jesus was tested in every way, tempted in every way as we are tempted, yet he did not sin. That would be the only difference between us and Christ Jesus. We get tempted and many people just cave into it and go and follow the demonic realm for whatever reward that they can temporarily find in that demonic realm only to suffer the consequences of, of death and if they don't get right with God, an eternal death. Because the way Jesus is sin is death. Now we have a grace of God that has brought us into a covenant where God continues to, do, continues to deal with us as the church, as the people redeemed, as individuals. But there is a space of time given to us to repent, to get it right, 
just like Jesus said over and again to the churches um, in, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And of course, we don't have to just go to that, that prophetic literature, which then people are going to argue, oh, well, you know, you've got to be careful about, you know, using literal examples from, you know, uh, prophetic material. Well, I first and foremost say that's ridiculous, but um, even if that were the case of someone's argument, we can show over and over again, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for after that he's tried, he shall receive a crown of righteousness, a crown of life, which does not fade away. So the idea that somehow temptation is a, is part of this, um, you know, this process of being sanctified, well, it just simply, once again, it, it it's wrong. It's just not true. Um, I know I'm, I'm running short on time already. Uh, and and for, fortunately, I'm probably, you probably notice I've laid a whole lot more proofs about what I'll, all, what I want to say. And there's so much more to say in terms of talking about this wonderful thing that God has done in sanctifying us. And, you know, can, can, there, can there be anything greater than to say that to describe a place of sanctification and to describe oneness with God. He's made us one with himself. How many times is that said over and over again? It's the heart of the faith. It's the heart of communion from John 6, 56, all the way through Romans 6, 3. I mean, think about it. I, I give you all those verses of scripture there that Christ dwells in us, that the indwelling of Christ is fundamentally the meaning of what it means to be born again. When we are born again, Christ comes into our life. Uh, when we were little, I mean, everybody used to sing the song, into my heart, into my heart. Uh, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Then, you know, we would sing, he's come into my heart, he's come into my heart, he's come into my heart, the Lord Jesus. Well, has he? Well, if he has, can there be anything else that would describe the necessity of needing to be sanctified, being brought into the realm of the holy, being so that ultimately God then has a fit dwelling place to, 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 uh, to live in? Well, not from, a, not from an Old Testament uh, foundation uh, point of view. We know that that's absolutely essential. And so God gave us a new heart. He gave us a new spirit so that he could have a fit dwelling place uh, for him to dwell in. And... Um, so oneness with Christ Jesus, he dwells in us, we dwell in him, praise God. Um, an, another great allegory of sanctification, of oneness with God, of having been made holy, of having been made a dwelling place of God. Think about it. God, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He dwells uh, alongside of us. Then we've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, total immersion into the presence of God. Whoa. You know, that we no longer live. It's Christ that lives. I, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me. It's Christ which lives within me. The reality that we have called again and again and commanded to, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to be conformed to the image. Ah, that's another verse of scripture, Romans 8, 29. That we're supposed to, you know, that people use that. Ah, see, it's, it's a process of sanctification. Look, we're being conformed to the image of, of Christ Jesus. No, it's a command. Be conformed to the image of Christ Jesus. <laughs> Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision uh, to fulfill uh, anything that belongs to your own uh, desires. And um, and, I co and of course, I know um, fleshly lust, but I like to even fine tune that a little bit better because people are lost in semantics, you know. Anything that has to do with your own desires. Um, <laughs> to, to be completely given over to this wonderful realm of the heavenly. That's who we are. Our conversation is in heaven. We're seated in heaven. I mean, think about all of these wonderful verses of scripture that empower us, that declare to us who we are uh, and, and, and the beautiful empowerment to be able to fulfill all that God has said about the, the, the promises and what he's willed for us. Another great verses of scripture or concept within the scripture that speaks to radical sanctification is uh, the allegory of Jesus being the vine and we're the branches. And, uh, you know, how, I mean, we're set into him. I mean, how much more could you be 
described as being set apart or sanctified and made holy and made a part of who Christ Jesus is than to be so connected with him as a branch is with the vine and that through him and by that kind of connectivity, then we live and, and we produce fruit. And if that kind of connectivity isn't there, then you don't even belong to him. And if you don't bring forth fruit, furthermore, then you, you wither from that vine and you are, you, you are, uh, cast forth from the vine. Uh, some pretty radical warnings there. And of course, a lot to say on that subject that debunks a whole lot of concepts and ideas that no one should believe in the first place. Um, but I, I'm not going to get into all of that. Uh, I just want you to understand, you know, consecration is our response to that which God has done for us. We, should, we must be consecrated to having been made holy. We must be consecrated to the new birth. We must be consecrated to this new life in Christ Jesus. We must be consecrated to live our life um, by the Holy Ghost, to be led by him, to be ruled by him, the sovereign authority of God in our life. Think about it. These are radical, beautiful things that God has described to us by the miraculous act, action of his word. And if we don't believe his word, then we will be just like those whom the gospel was preached to in the Old Testament and it never profited them because it was never mixed with faith. If we do, The word of God is the source of the miracle. And if we're not going to believe the word of God as he's described it, when we're not going to have his results. If we don't do it according to as he's, as the, uh, the pattern that he's given, then his glory's not going to be there. We're not going to have uh, the overcoming authority. We're not going to know this wonderful, victorious life, this life that has made us more than conquerors over all the things that would come at us. So I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that every one of you will just dig in deep and really get these fundamental truths established in your life and, and understand that there is no difference between Hebrew Kadosh for holy and the Hebrew word, uh, the Greek word agiatso, uh, or all the other, um, you know, equivalent terminologies that we would use. Because uh, if you looked in the Septuagint, for example, if I need to convince you of this, then the, those particular words um, are interchangeable in the sense that that's the Greek words that were used to translate uh, the Hebrew words. So we're not, you know, we don't have to worry or be concerned that somehow. Um, you know this that that definitions word uh, word meanings somehow has shifted and been changed in reality all that god has spoken of and promised has now been fulfilled in us and so now we we keep we walk and keep in in the ways of god and keep the things of the law by nature think about it i mean god has written his laws upon our heart and upon our minds so that we will do them upon our heart and upon our minds so that we will do them god called israel uh uh goy gadosh uh which is a holy nation or gadosh goy you could say it either way uh, a holy nation i mean how much more are we are ho are we a holy nation we are, we are uh, a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a highly treasured people. Uh, as, as Peter then takes uh, those things that were said about Israel and puts them right in the midst of the church because the church is the fulfillment of all that God had promised a nation. He brought forth or brought a nation into being because Abraham was willing to respond to God so that he could bring forth his only begotten son. And now that he's brought forth our salvation, his salvation, then all that was said by God and promised by God has been fulfilled to all nations. So he's made of two different, uh, of the, all the, the two categories, all the nations of the world and Israel. He's made them one new man so that we could all now step into this wonderful state of holiness. I mean, if they were a holy nation, how much more are we a holy nation? Uh, it, you know, think about the reality of how much greater it is now in, in, in the New Testament than it was in the shadow and the type. And of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is devoted to really grabbing our attention and helping us to appreciate that this is far greater in, in glory. And so, um, real quickly, saints, God has called us saints. He's made us able to be, so he says in Ephesians 3, 18, 19, it's the verse of scripture I use. He says that you may be able to comprehend with all saints, all the holy ones, 
What is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And saints is, is from the Greek word um, hagioi, and it means holy ones. And, and um, in fact, all of the Bible, all of the New Testament, uh, uh, Paul writes over and again to the holy ones, to the saints. He never writes to the unholy ones. He never writes to the pagans. He never writes to those people who are just a bunch of heathens. He never writes to the ungodly. There is an identification with those who are sanctified in Christ or made holy in Christ, as I've already said, called to be holy ones. He says it 63 times in the New Testament. Huh? <laughs> it is used to identify the people of God 41 times in the Old Testament. Okay, he's called them saints, 40 holy ones. And uh, so we said, see, that's positional. No, it's not. He gave them the gift and then held them responsible for how they behaved. He didn't hold the rest of the nations responsible in the same way. God had empowered them to be his people, to be a display of his kingdom on the earth, to be a, that, where, that place where he would dwell among uh, humanity. And they were unwilling, many, were unwilling to obey. There were those who did obey. Think about um, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They walked in all holiness and righteousness before God. I mean, think about, go read that in uh, Luke chapter one. I think it's probably beginning right around verse 71, 72, something like that. Read the testimony of, of the purity of, of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth. I mean, read the testimony of the purity of Mary. And she was just a, a woman of the covenant. They weren't special and unique. They were just those who took a hold, laid hold on the power of God that was made available to them to be the people of God in the earth. And that's really what makes the difference here. You know, are you going to lay hold on the power of God? Or are you going to believe what God has said? Lay hold on the power of God that has been given to us to, to be the people of God, to be <laughs> a unique people in the earth, most glorious, most wonderful, most blessed, most joyful people on the earth. Are we going to be tempted? Yes. Is, Satan going to, is, is the powers of darkness going to come at us to try to claim us? Just like Pharaoh came running after Israel after the miracle of their salvation? Sure. But what are you going to do? I mean, if you'll grab a hold of what God has done for you, there's no power greater than power than his power. There's no might greater than his might. And come on, people. It's about time to start shouting glory. It's about it's time to start shouting victory. It's about time that there becomes, you know, those that, Paul, that John writes to, I write unto you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've defeated Satan at every point. Come on, it's, it's, it's about time, you know, that we really start laying hold on all that Father has made available to us. Um, you know, I, I put it there in, that in, in, um, in Romans, um, Paul refers to uh, God's people as saints over and over and over again. How many times? I list all, I think I list all of the times uh, and all the verses of scripture out for you, especially that in the New Testament in which we come to understand that saint or a holy one is a general term that is used for everybody who's a born again believer, who have been made sons of God, who live and walk in and are led by the Holy Ghost. How many verses of scripture? <laughs> so, I mean, I pray in Jesus name that you won't let anybody steal these things for you, from you because they're exceeding great and precious promises that have been given to us whereby we've been made partakers of the divine nature and have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We've escaped. And, and, and seeing as these things have happened, then you're going to give all diligence to make your calling election sure and you're going to add to your faith um, virtue, virtue and to virtue knowledge. And you're going to give yourself completely over to learning how to function and grow and mature and develop in all the ways of God. I mean, we've been given the, given the best possible thing that we could ever have or want. Why would we neglect it? Why would we turn away from it? Now, there's a few other verses of scripture that, you know, I've left out that people use to justify progressive sanct sanctification uh, versus scripture like Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, Paul says, purify yourself from the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness and the fear of God. You know, that's really just saying, 
uh, he's really saying the same thing as uh, everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he's pure. We keep ourselves unspotted from the world, okay? That's really what we're saying here. God has done this wonderful thing. Now you walk in obedience. Now you don't allow former conversation, you know, you reckon yourself in dead, dead, indeed dead unto sin, but alive unto God. You're giving yourself over to this wonderful act, um, wonderful, glorious realm of holiness and bringing forth fruits of righteousness. I mean, you know, I just can't, I, I almost got to quote the entire New Testament <laughs> uh, to, to really, um, well, in quoting this, every every page on the uh, in the New Testament is is doing nothing other than validating and supporting this wonderful and glorious salvation that God has given to us. That we've been purified, we've been regenerated, we've been given the divine nature, that we've been given God's life, that we've been given godliness. Wow, and to reject it is just simply not it is to have a manifestation that you don't really want what Christ Jesus offers. Christ Jesus offers escape from the world, escape from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, to come into a realm in which now we learn to walk in the ways of life instead of being held in the realms of death. And, you know, it, it, there is tr there is a truth about believing with all of your heart because if you don't believe with all of your heart, how are you, not gonna, how are you, how are you gonna somehow have the greatest miracle that there is? And we've, we've minimized it, we've, unfortunately reduced to the sacred to the common and the ordinary and I pray in Jesus name that you won't do that and if you've done it in the past you won't do it anymore and so let me just real quickly uh, try to to uh, touch on uh, the uh, subject of maturity confused with sanctification because we are growing I mean we start off as newborn babes um, God calls us to be holy even as he is holy, but we've talked about his holiness and there's parts of his holiness that, you know, <laughs> I don't see us ever coming to, we can't because part of his holiness and description of his holiness is that he's eternal. He's everlasting to everlasting. I mean, we're, 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 we get to be eternal through the future, but we're not eternal through the past. We had a moment in the beginning, um, you know, and, and God's always going to be God and above all things, and, and awesome and wonderful and who he is, you know, unique from everybody else because he's the creator and he's so wonderful. But that doesn't in any way hold us back from realizing and understanding of what he's, you know, given us the capacity to do, to do and to be. We were made sons so that we could grow mature as sons. We were made holy, given the gift of holiness, so that we could grow mature in holiness. If we had not been made sons, we cannot grow as sons. If we were not given the gift of holiness, there's no way we could mature into all the realms of holiness. If we were not given the gift of righteousness and renewed in his image and his likeness, there would be no way that we could grow and mature in righteousness. As newborn babes, we're supposed to desire the sincere milk of the word so that we may grow thereby or mature. That has nothing to do with some process of sanctification. Very, very important. Um, you know, it, it, what's, what, what bothers me the most about an idea or a concept or process of sanctification? It's like you never get there. It, it's, it's like laying aside the, the sin and the weight that so easily besets us. And people are constantly talking about that. Well, when are you going to get the job done? Okay. So we hear that in Ephesians 4, 12 through 13, the Lord says that, you know, the ministry is given, the prophets, apostles, well, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the equipping of the holy ones, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a fully matured man of the measure of the maturity of the fullness of Christ. Now, Paul is going to go on to say that you've got one of two choices here. You're either going to do this or you're going to continue to be babes, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I mean, you know, uh, Paul says the same thing to the church at Corinth. I mean, he, he warns them. I mean, look, guys, you're walking as babes. As long as you're walking carnal, you're some are saying, "I'm of this. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a this denomination." And others, "I'm of that denomination." And some people, the superiority complex that gets with some of the Pentecostal denomination, it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's worse than saying, "I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas." 
And Paul says, you just kind of got walking as mere men. Um, that had that did not in any way delete or remove the reality that they had if they had been born again and they were been given the gift of holiness and given the gift of righteousness and been made sons of God and been empowered by the Holy Ghost and the indwelling of Christ where the well spring springing of the life of God you know when you, and I I really didn't do justice to all of these uh, title you know topics because you know, you think about it. When you've got the life of God in you, God's life is holy. God's life is pure. God's life is glorious. To say that God's life dwells in us, I mean, how could you say anything less than you are made holy, that you are sanctified when that life has come into us? And somehow people want to get the notion that they don't fully belong to God. And somehow, you know, they've got to work this thing out because they misunderstood a verse of scripture in Philippians about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling and not recognizing the next verse, which is absolutely important, knowing that it's God that does the work. <laughs> well, you know, um, growing in grace is, is absolutely our privilege and our blessing of which we have been empowered with the ability to, ability to do so. And um, if we were not brought into the, into the realms of God, into the sphere of that which belongs to him, there would be none of us that could grow because Satan would hold a power over us internally and externally. And there would be no way. I mean, that spirit of rebellion, that spiritual death that um, was incurred by Adam in the garden would, would by and large, prevent us and you know I say that with hesitation because Enoch did a great job with walking with God and not being born again and I can go on Elijah did Moses did Abraham I mean Abraham's like sin nature right <laughs> I mean he he's not born again you can't say that Abraham was born again and the Lord looks at him and says and empowers him and says I'm your I'm your resourcer I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward walk before me and be perfect and you know did you hear Abraham saying what are you talking about God nobody can be perfect I, I you're expecting way too much of me no he was empowered by God and it's about time you and I start getting empowered instead of threatened um, I think I've run out of time Good thing you've got the notes. You can go through these uh, notes that I have there in the book and you can recognize, uh, yeah, there is a maturation that's going on and and there is a, a, a giving ourselves, you know, to this godliness, to this realm of life, to that which God the Holy Spirit is here to teach us. He's come to lead us and guide us in all truth. As newborn babes, we're going to grow, we're going to mature, we're going to go from children and to it to a, a place of, of fatherhood in the realms of the Spirit, if you would. And and um, so I pray every one of you lay hold on what God has said. Believe his word because it's from the word of faith. It's his word. You don't have to go try to get God somewhere and go bring Christ Jesus down, bring him up from the dead uh, because I promise you, he's right here dwelling on the inside of us. So what does the word of faith say? What does the righteousness which is of faith say? Uh, his word is near unto us, nigh unto me, even in my heart and in my mouth. This is the word of faith. This is the moving of God, the presence, the reality of God, the Father, God, the Holy Ghost, and God, Christ Jesus, living and abiding in us, and we're living and dwelling in him. We've been baptized in him. Love all of you guys. Bless you.